and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. In the last couple of weeks, there's been a huge outcry, as it ought to be, over the state of security in Nigeria. Killings in Zamfara, Plateau, Adamawa, Eboni states, and others have been largely responsible for this. But another threat, which seems even more sinister, is that being waged on Nigerians by those who deal in fake, substandard, and expired products without a bother about the consequences it could have on the populace in the immediate to long term. I sat recently with the head of Nigeria's Consumer Protection Council, Babatunde Irukera, on the battle with people of the underworld who specialize in these nefarious acts and their seeming strong networks within circles of government. However, before we went into that conversation, I asked him if the mandate of the CPC shouldn't be streamlined. Babasunde Irukera, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you. Providing speedy redress to consumers' complaints through negotiation, mediation, and conciliation, seeking ways and means of removing from the markets hazardous products and causing offenders to replace such products with safer and more appropriate alternatives, publishing from time to time lists of products whose consumption and sale have been banned, withdrawn, severely restricted, or not approved by the federal government. These are among some of your mandates. That is correct. Pretty broad. And this is just a fraction of it. Absolutely. Do you think it should be streamlined? Do you think the mandate of the CPC, the Consumer Protection Council, should be streamlined? Well, I don't see how statute can streamline the mandate. But what I think would obviously provide the streamline are the operational manuals, the operational guidelines, and the strategies which reach you. Um, the strategies you adopt to enforce your mandate. But as far as the law, the law is what it is. You cannot narrow the law uh, because for uh, the piece of legislation for consumer protection, narrowing it is ex essentially exposing the consumers. Mm. The reason I ask this is because, you know, a lot of people have asked, how do you deal with overlap? Uh, you seem to have some of the functions of some regulatory agencies, NAFDAQ, the uh, Standards Organization of Nigeria, the, even the NCAA, I think the National um, the the Aviation Authority. Yes, yes, they recently complained, some people, some stakeholders complained that you're, you were meddling in their business, it would seem. Uh, how do you deal with that? Well, regulatory overlap itself is not erroneous. It's a plan and it's fine. And especially in consumer protection, that is the one place where you must have regulatory overlap. Businesses are very smart. And what it is, is that if there are cracks in the regulatory process, like the, like the proverbial lizard, you would operate right inside that crack where there's absolutely no law to cover you. And some of the most developed commercial environments where commerce is at its best, both in speed and volume, have incredible overlapping regulations. Take the United States, for instance. In every single space, including criminal investigation, there are regulatory overlaps. So take, for instance, in drug offenses, you've got the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Agency, Customs and Border Patrol. You've got the state police, airport police sometimes, city police. And all of them do this work together. What it is, is that you must have those regulatory overlaps to, to ensure that nothing slips through the cracks. Now, what determines effectiveness is how the regulators uh, uh, perceive their work and how they leverage on the strengths of each other to execute their mandates. Mm, which is a big challenge because some people will say if you already have complaints coming from agencies like the NCAA who believe that you might be meddling in their business or an area that is their territory and you know people looking at the fact that I mean I'm looking at this seeking ways and means of removing from the markets hazardous products I'm wondering, isn't that for NAFDAQ or for the SON? Oftentimes what we see is rivalry among government agencies. How do you handle that? Well, the, the, the easiest way to handle that is that, first, we, the regulators, must understand that a lot of the rivalry, sometimes, it's not even from the regulators themselves. For instance, I advised the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority for many years. As a matter of fact, the current consumer protection rules of the Civil Aviation Agency I, I wrote them. Uh, I, I led the team that wrote them. And so I would be the last person to violate those rules. I know exactly what it is. And what might be interesting is that it is not out of place that you would have a general consumer protection authority. And 
you'd have a consumer protection component in the roles or at least uh, um, in, the, in the mandates of uh, sector regulators. And it's fine. But what that does is, for instance, the consumer protection authority in itself, its only constituency is the consumers. It doesn't have any conflict. It doesn't receive any licensing fee. It doesn't have anything to do with the operators. Mm. But with each sector regulator, what they're trying to do is balance the rights of consumers against the rights of the operators. That's where you get your licensing fees from. That's where they get their upkeep from. And so they rightly have to understand what those problems are. And in the Consumer Protection Authority, it's good to understand those problems, but it's also important to be absolutely clear what your constituency is. And so it's typical that you might have consumer protection components in other pieces of legislation. And what usually would happen is some type of a collaboration. And so what usually would be the case is that a consumer protection authority would have its strength across the board in different areas. But for that particular reason, we're not specialize in everything. Mm -hmm. Whereas a sector regulator would specialize in some things. And because of that specialization, you're able to collaborate. I'll give you an example using the aviation as, an, as, as, as a test case. I remember when I was advising the aviation authority many, many years ago, and we were writing the consumer protection rules with respect to delays and uh, cancellation of flights. And the consumer protection uh, council at the time was repeatedly uh, pressuring about how the, the the rules were insufficient. And I remember one of the things that the, uh, the technical people in the NCA said at the time is, listen, we've got to recognize that there's some infrastructure deficits that would affect consumer protection. For instance, we're not able to get uh, Jet A1 fuel at the right on the air side, uh, as most other places in the world. So in, in a Boeing 747, we take what? Maybe two, three truckloads. Uh, of, 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 of jet A1 fuel and, and jet fuel. And so if they're going to truck all of that from a jetty, maybe in Oshodi or even from a close by in the air, uh, from the airport and there's traffic. And I think at that time there was construction going on on the upper power Oshodi Express. So that kind of information, that kind of specialization by the uh, aviation authority is what would assist the Consumer Protection Council in finding the balance. But imagine if it was left entirely onto the Aviation Authority, even with the best of intention. The unintended consequence is a level of understanding with the operational difficulties that in some ways might constitute exposure for the consumers. Mm. And so with respect to food and drugs, for instance, again, how do you expect a food and drug agency that has licensed something to say it is safe for you to ultimately at some point find out that not only is it unsafe, it is actually absolutely injurious. And I totally understand the situation where, you know, you can differentiate and say, well, in the, in the part of being proactive, in the part of licensing, in the part of ensuring that things that are in the market are safe for consumers, one can say it might be the job of the regulators. And maybe the consumer or the CPC should come in when consumers have been hurt or have a complaint. But it would seem that you're also to take on the job of also being proactive at the same time uh, while also protecting the consumer. Is that right? Absolutely. And the reason why, if you're not proactive, if all you do is to ameliorate or mitigate injury, Sometimes, especially with consumption, it's fatalities. If you're, you're doing, doing going to be proactive and you have to go yourself, I mean, to the markets, for yes. instance, isn't yes. that stretching you? Isn't that, you know, duplicating capacity even for the country? Well, not necessarily. And I'll give you an example. So, for instance, you've got any product in the market that complies with standards, say even rice, I mean, or anything else. Uh, and, and that has been certified fine by a standards uh, agency, whether the NAFDAQ or this or SUN, the Standards Organization of Nigeria. That's where their work ends. There's no liability on the part of any producer or service provider once they've manufactured or provided a service to the applicable standards. But the role of the Consumer Protection Council goes beyond the standards. As far as we're concerned, if there's injury on account of consumption, then there must be someone who's held accountable for that. Yeah. I'll give you a quick. Now, that's a key word. I mean, yes. if there is injury, yes. not that you know you're going again to double check. But you know, let's even come to the question of capacity. Do you really have the capacity? You're you're in Navdex's business. You're in Sun's business. You're in NERC's. I mean, you're also taking on electricity complaints, which is a lot. You're taking on NCC telecommunications, you know, complaints, which is a lot. NCA isn't that stretching the CPC uh, CPC's capacity? If at all, it does have that capacity. 
capacity. Oh, well, it is stretching the capacity. But what you must also recognize is that the way we do our work is in collaboration with those people. So it's not like CPC gets a complaint about uh, a, a broken meter and we're going to send out technicians or engineers to go check if that meter is actually broken or if the integrity of the meter is, is fine or not. Or it's not, I mean, we're not going to go into safety issues with respect to aviation. We won't go into food safety issues or the standards also. But so what, what would happen is, for instance, when we get things, we don't have a big laboratory of ours. We're going to send it to Sun, send it to NAFDAQ. And so it's that working together. And so I don't need to duplicate the capacity in all the other regulatory agencies. And so the, as far as the question of whether we have the capacity, so look at, I mean, we're looking at cables, electricity, and all those other things. So if I was going to create a lab of my own, would I have a food lab? Would I have a material testing lab? I mean, where's that, where, where would those resources come from? And then you're going to have an agency that's probably going to be as big as a state in itself, if we're going to cover that. And so it's really how the work gets done, the, the regulatory interface, the relationship between regulators. And that's what really ultimately provides the best possible um, 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 protection for, for consumers. How much confidence would you say Nigerians have in the system to report uh, you know, issues, especially when they feel that they have been wrong? Do they think that the process is fast enough or do they think that you know, perhaps it's too complicated and too complex for us to use. I think there's a balance somewhere. There's a mix there. I mean, there's some level of cynicism in the sense that uh, there's a long history of people not having uh, no a lack of responsiveness and, and that you can see people are jaded on account of that. But what I'm also finding is that people are responding. And what they really need is that there is a regulator who does truly really just pays attention and is responsive. For instance, I say to you that the rate at which complaints are increasing with, at least in the period that I've been at the Consumer Protection Council, it's, like, it's astronomical. It's extremely Can high. Can you give a percentage? Um, I would say that in the period I've been there, there's just no way that we wouldn't have seen at least a 60% ra uh, ra raise in, in complaints. And so that stretches our internal capacity. There's no question about that. But I mean, I, I, we do the best we can with the tools we have. One of the things we're doing is looking to leverage technology and then to also develop strategies where we push some of the things out. For instance, if you really think about it, the vast majority of companies in Nigeria, including multinationals, don't have standalone complaint resolution mechanisms. And so in some sense, what it is is that most companies have essentially outsourced their complaint resolution to the federal government. And so the federal government is subsidizing their business. Because what it is is that so somebody buys a can of Coke for what, 100 and something naira, and that company doesn't have a standalone, clear, easily accessible complaint resolution mechanism. Is that so, something you're going to, you know, ask? Absolutely. That, absolutely. you know, companies have? Absolutely. As a matter of standards? Absolutely. Absolutely. How is that going? Are and, you going to be pushing for it by legislation? Well, not necessarily legislation. And what, what I've done is... I've met with the major associations of the different, whether it's the food service people and all, and I've said, look, you have to start creating standalone complaint resolution mechanisms. And one of the ways that I'm pursuing that is that we are automating our complaint resolution mechanism anyway. And so we're creating a spore on that, a technology spore, so that companies can plug in. And when complaints come in, we're going to shoot it right out to them. So they become the first responders because they're the ones who have a commercial and a social contract with their customers to serve them. And so it's only complaints that they do not fix that we'll get into. And then there's gonna be a cost. We would make sure that when you do not resolve the grievances between you and your customers, and we have to get involved, the government finds a value to that and makes you pay for that so that you would do that. And so those are the ways that we would address capacity. So you don't necessarily need a thousand people or a call center of 500 people. Yes, boots on the ground, more soldiers are very vital. And I think the council needs to expand its capacity, both from a recruitment and from a tool standpoint. But yes, not all of the capacity issues are going to be addressed just by having more people. Mm -hmm. We'll take a moment now when we return we will focus on the recent battle with dealers in expired rice in Akwaibom. please stay with us
Welcome back. You're watching Hard Copy coming to you from our studios in Abuja. Director General of Nigeria's Consumer Protection Council, Babatunde Irukera, is our guest tonight. And we're about to delve into a recent experience with dealers in expired rice products in Akwaibom and their collaborators in government. You were on a mission recently in Akwaibom where you apprehended some Nigerians, in, maybe I should just say criminals, involved in bagging fake and expired rice for consumers. Now you wrote your experience, you wrote on your experience based on that. And on the back of that, you said, for the first time, I publicly admit, I am afraid. I truly am. What's your fear? Well, my fear is that we live in a society where fundamentally people are reckless. I'm not and that's not necessarily a, 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 a governance failure, but there's just simple recklessness. I mean, if we cannot as individuals literally look at something and say that this is dangerous for someone else to consume, and on account of that, I'm not going to put that in the market, then it means that we have merchants of debt who we're living with. And that is scary. And there's really so much you can do. And I give an example in that saying that, look, you can, I can avoid the rice by looking to the specific location where I can buy the right rice. Because of my role, in any case, I can know where to buy rice. But when I, what about when I visit friends? What about when I give rice as, a gift, as gifts? What about when I go to a restaurant to eat? And so it is really scary. And to imagine that, how much can you do to protect yourself? You've got family and friends all over the place. And so my real fear was just that we focus a lot on what we think are the key issues, but there are so many subliminal issues that are nearly as bad and sometimes even worse that we're not addressing. On the back of that particular experience, uh, you, you talked about your, your, your uh, relationship or the collaboration you had to have with a lot of other government agencies, which we will come to shortly. But you said, uh, I really don't know if we've killed this one. I mean, you talked about preying on a business or a business that preys on survivability. You say you don't know if you've killed that business, but you surely dealt them a blow. What do you think that Nigerians, and that will be the people and the government, need to do to kill businesses like that? The one thing that needs to happen, obviously, is the kind of thing we did. We need to do a whole lot more of that. And beyond that, we need a very strong consequence management system. We need to prosecute people like this. And when they're prosecuted, if they are convicted, they need to serve a term of imprisonment. 36 hours after that operation, you had a lot of pressure coming in from even the stranger, strangers' quarters, some of them within government circles. Uh, and that for you was extremely shocking. Do you think that, you know, first of all, have you escalated that issue, you know, to the appropriate authorities, to the authorities who should do something about the pressure that you faced? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, I have. And as a matter of fact, even today I had, uh, uh, including yesterday, you know, I had uh, very important meetings with respect to holding public officers who did not fully understand their role uh, accountable for their conduct in the specific, uh, uh, the specific role they played in this process. Is it a question of just not understanding their roles or choosing to use their roles for selfish ends? Well, I suppose I have a long history as a defense lawyer, so I'm very slow to conclude that there was compromise or there was an uh, um, uh, uh, inanimate objective. Because I know that in one of the, with one of the people who participated in this, at least what they conveyed to me in my conversation with the person seemed to be a lack of understanding of that person's role. No. Now, is that excusable? No, it's not. But does it necessarily suggest a potential compromise? I do not know. Mm. You talked about battling a judicial process that was an onslaught of the criminals against us, the protectors. You talked about how it would seem that the inmates were now in charge of the asylum. Uh, how did that feel for you, especially considering your background as a lawyer? I, I couldn't have possibly prepared for that at all. Because, like, like you rightly said, uh, my, my background is as a lawyer. And, and I've, on many occasions, I've been on the other side. And so what we did with this operation was to carefully plan it. We looked at the law and we operated strictly by the rules. And so for someone, for instance, on a Saturday morning, for the police to say, well, we've got a problem. We understand that there's an injunction coming. First, what injunction is going to come on a Saturday morning? What court order? 
would come on a Saturday morning. For you to have a lawyer who is a public servant, works for the federal government, in that role as a lawyer, to come out and say, you know what, I must restrain or restrict the operations of another agency of the government. So it just seems like a skewed process. It just seems like the legal process that should have been the defense or the protection that we would have as agents of government seem to work against us. And I just imagine how much worse it would have been for my colleagues who were part of this operation if I wasn't a part of the operation or if I wasn't making those calls myself. And so it just does seem like the inmates are running the asylum. So have you had any conversation with, say, the Attorney General, the Inspector General of Police, uh, the Customs, who seem to be doing some work in trying to stop foreign rights from coming in, how much more uh, fake or expired rights from coming into the country? Have you had a conversation with the, with the top brass? I have had conversations with every single one of those people you've spoken about, save the Attorney General. And uh, I was supposed to meet with him today. I'm looking forward to doing that tomorrow. And um, my conversations with every single one of these people has been very collaborative. And I've gotten the kind of cooperation that I got in the last hours of that from them. And uh, they're working uh, as hard as they can to make sure that this, the integrity of the investigation is secure. And then the legal process works the best way it should with respect to holding these people accountable. I'll go to the beginning of your statement. You say that uh, you are the fork in the road. You don't know whether to be encouraged or discouraged, motivated or demotivated, inspired or retire, energized or tranquilized, activated or deactivated. Those were your words. I mean, that was how strongly you felt on the wake or in the wake of that particular operation. How do you feel now? Well, I'm not uh, deactivated. I am not tranquilized. Um, I think... There's a battle for the soul of a nation here. And if I think that I have anything to contribute to that battle, walking away from it is one soldier less in the front. And so I am still scared, but I realize that we don't even have the time to stop and think. That's a luxury. Because in reality, we can think the biggest problems are with the people in the National Assembly or those in the State House or in the Cabinet when there is a meeting there. Well, maybe there are problems there, but there are far bigger problems like I've discovered even in a market in faraway Uyo. And until we can make sure that people do not exploit people, until we can make sure that people can look at something and say that even from just an appropriate standard standpoint, we cannot put this in the market. We cannot exploit people in this manner. Until we can ensure that that is the case for our nation, every person, every voice, and every effort counts. You are trying to get your agents at the CPC to work and work as it ought to, because some of the people that were apprehended after they were interviewed uh, said that, you know, that they usually come around. It's not like as if they didn't know that we sold those products, but they were bribed and they left us alone. Uh, how important do you think it is to get people at the head who are motivated and how do you think they will be stopped from being discouraged when they see say the attitude of, i do not know what sort of staff you have uh, but sometimes you know you might be on your own drive and then you might just be getting another type of attitude from the people who work with you well the one thing i know is that if there was one employee of the consumer protection council who has ever been compromised in this manner or who fits the bill of that description by one of the people who was arrested I not only would I make sure that person loses that job, I will ensure that person is prosecuted. I, and, and that's the only way. I mean, if the consequence for doing the wrong thing is to take away what you have earned from doing it, it's what the risk. And so that for me is what I intend to do. And I'm hoping that other chief executives or other agencies realize that. And so the only way to build our institutions are two things, is to make sure that there are standards there are processes and the consequence for violating those standards and processes are apparent. And not only are they apparent, they are enforceable and they do become enforced. Mabatini Rukera, thank you for coming on Hard Copy. Thank you. Well, that's Hard Copy tonight. We thank you for always sending your mails and tweets. If you also want to send yours, 
please do so using hard copy at channelstv.com or at CTV hard copy. Thank you for watching tonight. I'm Maokwe Ogun Yusuf. Good night.